Welcome to Visual Theory and Practice Ceramics. I'm Wesley Wright, your instructor. Just a quick overview, this course is a art and art history, or rather just plain old history class. We're going to look at four distinct cultures in different time periods and the artworks that those cultures create, and then we will interpret the art forms that they make uh, in a personal and modern context and create artworks based on the work that those cultures create. We'll be looking at West African masks, Peruvian mochi pots, relief sculpture made by Persians slash Achaemenids and Greeks, and the California funk art movement. As we look at these different cultures, we want to always be objective. So to not judge a culture um, by, you know, ethnocentric standards, we want to be objective of a person or their judgment, not influenced by personal feelings or opinions in considering and representing facts. So you want to not be subjective when you look at history of a person or their judgment based on or influenced by personal feelings, tastes, or opinions. You know, if you think about how history is often written, it's by the people who win wars. Um, it's written from a certain perspective and you know, to get a real, um, a real idea of the culture, you want to hear it from their own perspective. So keep that in mind as you look at history. History is extremely complex. Any attempt to to tell a comp, pardon me, any attempt to tell a complete and nuanced history is doomed to fail. Historians generally try their best to illustrate the important events, characters, and trends in history to give us a sense of the overall story. Yeah, so it's a generalization. It's impossible to tell a perfect history. Ethnocentrism, to judge another culture solely by the values and standards of one's own culture. We try to abandon our ethnocentrism as we look at history. Cultural appropriation. So in this class, we are, in a way, doing a form of cultural appropriation in that we're interpreting these art projects, these, um, these arts that these specific cultures make. We're interpreting them and recreating them. And we want to do that in a respectful way. So cultural appropriation is to adopt a culture or aspects of a culture as one's own. And this can be done thoughtfully and respectfully, or it can be done not so thoughtfully and respectfully. Native Americans um, uh, have had their culture appropriated, and here seeing it in a fashion context is, you know, not, not thoughtful. It's a bit awkward, maybe disrespectful. Um, we have the, the Rizza here. Uh, you know, he respects... Um, Chinese culture, certainly. Um, maybe some people might not appreciate his interpretations, but um, he, he's a little bit fam flamboyant, uh, but, you know, teach their own. Vanilla Ice, uh, appropriating black culture in doing hip-hop. Very much criticized for doing that. Uh, maybe, maybe he was not the most authentic or respectful in the way that he appropriated black music. Um, so just food for thought. First, we'll be looking at some West African cultures. And if we go back far enough, some of these cultures might be called primal in their structure. And let's talk about why. Cultures can often be defined by their religions. Historical religions are religions with a cumulative written history. They have been around for about 4,000 years. Oral cultures have no written history 
and pass down information through ceremony, storytelling, and other means. They have been around for about 3 million years. Primal communities are usually small, subsistence, and oral. They pass down their information through language, not written. They're small, often 20 to 50 members. Subsistence, everything they needed, they hunted, gathered, processed, and produced together as a group. Oral, they had a sophisticated system in which they passed information from generation to generation on tradition, belief, history, and practical knowledge, but there was no written language. Everything was spoken and remembered. Primal cultures did not experience the Neolithic Revolution, or at least not on a large scale. The Neolithic Revolution, sometimes called the First Agricultural Revolution, was the wide-scale transition of many human cultures from a lifestyle of hunting and gathering to one of agri agriculture and settlement, making possible an increasingly large population. These settled communi communities permitted humans to observe and experiment with plants to learn how they grew and developed. This new knowledge led to the domestication of plants. It occurred about 12,500 years ago. So primal cultures, they still often farm, but not on the level that would allow them to create large-scale societies focused in one spot in in the way we think of like a city or a large settlement. So here's just a drawing of what an ancient Mesopotamian farm might have looked like. So this would be shortly after the Neolithic Revolution in Iraq, 5400 BC. So Houston Smith describes three features of primal cultures. The way that they think about time, place, and how they are oral in their cultures. Houston Smith is a author, a religious anthropologist, and otherwise interesting scholar. So time, they believe that time is eternal or timeless that it doesn't go, it's not linear, it doesn't go in a straight line. It's more, more timeless, not even necessarily cyclical, but eternal. Eternal or timeless. Many activities in which they engage, they feel that they are one with the eternal God or archetype of this activity. So meaning like when they are hunting, they are unified with the, with the deity of hunting just as they have, they believe that they have been doing since time began and will continue to do until time ends or it won't end, they'll just keep doing it. Uh, the God who created or first performed the activity that they are sort of in, in unison in harmony with that God. Place. They are one with their place and feel that they have a strong connection to everything in their environment. That they don't see a strong separation between themselves and the objects and plants and such around them. Animism. That they will sort of give living characteristics to otherwise inanimate things like rocks, trees, and they're connected to those objects. Orality. Because they don't write down their history, they're forced to remember everything. Therefore, they have excellent memories. The only, they only know what they need to know and eliminate unnecessary information. So whereas we have to find the needle in the haystack to get our information. They only have the needle, right? They only have the information that they need. And there's certainly benefits to that. You know, you go on 
the internet, you're trying to find the answer to your question and you find a million answers going off in a million different directions. And how do you know what is the most useful information? Well, there's ways of vetting information that hopefully we're all uh, continuously improving on. But in an oral culture, the information is there. That's the information. That's all you got. So you always know what to do. And that is the end of the intro presentation. The next video will get more in depth into specifically looking at some masks and some cultures that create those masks.